you trust your crypto assets to centralized exchanges that actively sell your private information and front run your trades? Would you like to buy and sell your assets without any middlemen, intermediaries, or robots? Do you like paying slippage fees and having the price go up as bots steal from you on low liquidity decentralized exchanges? The solution is NodeMarket.io set your guaranteed buy or sell price. No middlemen, no slippage, no bots ever. Buy or sell 1, 10, or even 10 million tokens and you never have to worry. OTC trades are between you and the seller or buyer, guaranteed by audited smart contracts and no human middlemen. NodeMarket.io <laughs>let's see oh do you, you see what's behind me hold on well i'll show you i'm gonna grab it i'll show you i see it. I see it oh yeah is it backwards or can you read it? Anyway, this one is the uh, this is the one the one the box the XR one and then the XR two is the other. Here, I'll show you the uh, see if I can make it bigger. Hold on, I'm gonna make it bigger. So this is this one better here. And it's the number one. I haven't unboxed it yet because we can't marry the tokens yet. So, anyway, this is the number one one. And then the other one's the number two. So, I'll break these bad boys out, you know, soon. Uh, but not just yet. All right. Get my fancy ass new chair. What? The branding got me. I'm not, I'm not hating on this chair. Tell you what. I'm not hating on this chair. Okay. Let's see. Let's see. Yeah, I just got it. I'm pretty pretty happy about that. Um, I'll probably turn it on anyway, even though I can't do anything with it just yet. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, the stamp, the spinning stamp, you know, Howard, if you just blink a bunch of times, it's no longer spinning. Also, also, do you know, if you click on it, oh, I guess nothing happens <laughs> on my phone. If I click on it, it stops spinning. Oh, how about that? Howard, try on your phone. Anyway, morning, good morning, good morning. Let's see. Yeah, they should be coming in. And so they finished. Um, Tufi's actually here in L.A. We're going to go have um, – he's either going to be – he'll be here again tomorrow and the next day. We're going to have dinner and lunch, I think. But he's doing business stuff. So – the, the way I understand it is they're just working on the documentation so that when people launch these things, they'll have, they'll be able to go step by step, click, 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 and do everything they want. 
So that's what the 1155 token, the audit has come back. As far as I understand, clean, everything's good to go there. So that's good. So we're just probably days away. I would urge those of you that have licenses that need tokens to, you know, go out and get your tokens because when everybody is hungry and they all come to the same feeding bowl, there's not enough food. You know what I'm saying? So anyway, yeah. Hello, hello. Uh, but, uh, just, financial future is not scary. John, it's not scary. It's scary for people that don't know what they're looking at, though. That is true. Debt is scary. We're going to talk about debt today. Yep, the debt monsters. Let's see. Okay, okay, okay. Cool question. Are you concerned in any way about Elizabeth Warren's bill? No. Nine senators. Do you know how many senators there are? These are just people that are catering to their caucus. And Elizabeth Warren's got her own problems. Um, she may be on the receiving end of some questions she doesn't like answering about um, her affiliation with uh, Gary Gensler. Mm. And uh, yeah, so she's – Elizabeth may have stepped a little bit too far out over the edge. We'll see. Good for her. I hope she has good lawyers. Hello, hello. Bam. Charlie Brown's funny. Uh, okay, hello, hello. Let me get through these. Get through these bad boys. I don't know what all that is, Tim. Brandon, you know you can't send me shit while I'm on? I can't look at it, bro. Well, let's see. Uh, when you click on it, it will stop spinning, but the audio stops. Uh, ah. Let's see. Okay. Um, not enough money either. Well, there's never enough money, is there? Never enough money for us. It's funny because every time I can afford something, something bigger and better than I can't afford it. That's what keeps me from ever buying anything. All the stuff I want is so expensive that every time I can afford it, I want something bigger. And then once I want it, then I'd want something bigger. And then I can't afford that bigger thing. So I end up buying nothing. I'm a maximizer. The, it's it's good for fi your financial future, but it's bad for gratification. I am uh, usually unhappy. Although if this is what unhappy is, I'll take it. <laughs> if this is wrong, I don't want to be right. Yeah, she's just she's pushing too far. And it's kind of I had a buddy who was in the uh, he's in the rap game, and he was saying. He knew this guy that was like a get like a legit gangster that got into producing music and he was going out there and talking to everyone, but he was a super gangster, like cartel guy. And of course, he got enough publicity that he got eyeballs on him and he got arrested and got booked for like 20 years for drug conspiracy stuff. So, like, dude, if you're pulling shenanigans, you know, fuck up. And any of these, you know, this whole man, this whole thing where people Basically, these politicians believe that they are elected into perpetuity. And so – and they kind of are because voters don't really do, – you're like, oh, that name's familiar. I'll just check if that's fine. But you got to wonder about the people that keep um, electing Elizabeth Warren and the fact that like all of the people – she had, I don't know, over 600 people in her – district or whatever reaching out to her for help and she just ignored them all because the word crypto was in the email i mean it's pretty bad <laughs> it's like pretty embarrassing hold on let me see if i can find it uh okay uh warren sponsored oh, okay 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 brandon was giving me some details okay so warren sponsored 36 bills in the 118th congress zero passed 103 bills in the 117th congress zero passed 98 bills in the 116th Congress, zero passed. 80 bills in the 115th Congress, zero passed. 27 bills in the 114th Congress. Anybody want to guess how many of these passed? <laughs> That's it. Oh, and Brandon, I had sent you a text that said I thought that Adam would take out highs in 2024. We were we were chatting about that this morning. We were chatty Kathy's, Brandon and I, because we chat like Kathy. I guess if your name's Kathy and you're like, I don't even talk. Anyway, um, 
I get it that she's catering to her caucus. That's what you do to keep getting elected if you're a career politician. I'd be very curious to look at her balance sheet. Has she been just getting the whatever the base salary is for that position or does or does she have a higher net worth than her job could possibly allow? I believe the lady doth protest too much. We'll see. I mean, at some point, she's going to make the wrong enemies. And the thing is that as she starts, if she keeps what she's doing, you know, a few years ago, you could be anti-crypto. You could be anti-crypto to the moon. The minute BlackRock, Fidelity, Wisdom Tree, Van Eck, like all these firms started stepping up, Kathy included over at ARK, the minute all these firms started stepping up and saying we're going full crypto, at least for Bitcoin's sake, you're starting to – listen – Politicians' half-life is not good when you start fighting BlackRock. Matter of fact, not even half-life, your actual life <laughs> may be limited. Those dudes are for real, man. Larry Fink, it's in his name that he's a crook. And he, come on, man. You got to be a damn fool to go to war with BlackRock. And so all of these all of these politicians that are taking you know like the the whole stance that all of the money you know crypto is supporting crypto supporting the the north korean nuclear effort crypto um if without crypto no no nuclear weapons in north korea well that's fucking stupid and it's it's so stupid you wonder why people don't laugh at her out like in her face so you kind of just have to ignore people like that. It's like a little kid at a birthday party running around with his pants down. You just pretend it's not happening. Just go get somebody, get this kid out of here. Like where's, where are his bad satellite parents? Oh, they're drunk. They're drunk at the bar by the eggnog. Ugh. Of course they are. Of course they're drunk at the bar by the eggnog. When I was a kid, we had two eggnogs. We had the one that was for the kids. And then the one that was for parents, it said adults only. They put a little card. Adults only. That's the one that was spiked. And if you drank that, you would puke everywhere. Anyway, gosh. Um, yeah, I mean, all of this stuff, when you paint with, you just, people paint with unnecessarily wide brushes. Like lately, that's the big thing. You make these big grand statements, especially if you're, you know, politicking and all that stuff. But you make these big grand statements and people are like, I, okay, I guess. And it's the it's the Donald Trumping of politics. The best, the biggest. I have the best lawyers. Not right now, you don't. I have the best money. No, you don't. You're bankrupt. <laughs> like, come on, man. So uh, we'll see what Maga Gaga Gaga does. But yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't um worry too much about Elizabeth Warren because the more the more ridiculous she gets. It's even people around her are kind of like, uh, 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 uh. it's kind of like Brad Sherman. He's a, a perennial douchebag idiot, and people still vote him in because there's probably some things that Brad Sherman does that that keeps 51% of the people in that district voting him in, and it probably has nothing to do with crypto. Crypto is an easy thing that the that a, that a politician with very little intellect can go and attack. Because they're attacking it in front of other people with very little intellect. Remember, she's on a platform filibustering to a bunch of other very intellectually weak career politicians. Think for a second about how <laughs> how absurd and 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 oh god, kind of pathetic your life is. If you decide I want to be a career politician, what kind of prideful, self-serving piece of shit has to say, I've decided I'm the one who's going to speak for the good of the masses. What have you done? You've done nothing. How are you going to speak for the good of anything? So, yeah, term limits, all this kind of stuff. You can't have career – I was talking to this with my buddy the other day. You can't have career politicians. You can't have – listen, man. You you can't have career um, judges. 
you can't have career politics. The minute you get the career stamp, that like this is it forever. I mean, you go to cruise control. The, these politicians, they are the Ethereum of politicians, right? There's no, there's no reason for them to improve. There's no desire. They've got the hookup. They're getting rich. And they may start idealistic when they're in their 20s or their early 30s. They're getting, oh, I'm going to change the world. I'm going to change everything. Me. It's me against the man or whatever. And then they get in there and they are just as, as you know, corrupt and perverted and malicious and shitty as everyone else is. And they're like, well, at that point, they realize the futility of what they're doing. They just kind of give up the ghost. They're like, ah, I'll just take the check, man. Here, g- give me the envelopes. Let me take the the plane rides. Let me set up my future after politics, and I'll just go and give twenty five thousand dollar luncheons to a bunch of other assholes who who just light money on fire. And so it's like, I mean, I get why they get pathetic. <laughs> I get it. And and Charlene, I think it's always been that way. Um, and this is the problem. You look at American politics, you say, what a man, what a dumpster fire. This is a mess. Yeah. And it's still better than all the other ones. So that shows you that we're not there yet as far as governance and some of these, you know, whatever the amalgam of, of like an AGI human governance system in the future looks like, it's gotta be better than this bullshit that we have now. But at least in America, it's the best bat. It's the best bullshit on the planet. Because the other bullshit's really bad. So, you know, you just kind of like factor it as like, okay, these people are losers. And I often wonder what I would say in person to people like that. And I would just, there's no point. It's like, you're talking to a dummy. There's, you know, and people, and and again, from a distance, people don't say, hey, look at that really smart person talking to that idiot. They just say, oh, look at those two idiots. (laughs) Chuck E. Cheese Schumer. Oh, you know who else? Um, you know, you know who else is um, stupid? Um, God, what is it? The, the guy, he, he, um, Mitt Romney is now taking an anti-crypto position. <laughs> He's like anti-crypto. I'm like, Mitt, you, you're the one who got your ass kicked worse than like anybody that ever fought a young Mike Tyson. What are you talking about? Like, what do you go? Shut up. Stay, stay. What is it? In Massachusetts or something? Like, stay over there and shut up. Just be content being kind of rich and dodging taxes. Just shut up about, about the future because you these dudes that are like 80, no offense, man, but if you're like 80, I'm not sure you're the one I want ushering in my version of what the future is because you don't get it because you grew up with black and white TV, buddy. You grew up standing listening to the radio to, to, to decide whether the aliens were really attacking during, you know, when Orson Welles was talking, dummies, like, uh, I don't know, man. I don't know if that's, the, I don't know if they have the interpretive skills, the cognitive capacity to, to, to tell us what our future is going to look like and help build it. James, we're not talking about developments in crypto today, buddy. This is office hours. Ain't no crypto talk. And yes, there's lots of new developments every day. You got to get the news for that, buddy. This is where Tuesdays and Thursdays is where we expand our brain boxes. Mm. Well, that is true. And it is our job to explain crypto, not to sell it. And it isn't even really crypto. Oh, that's right. That's right. He's uh, he's a former Massachusetts governor. That's right. He's in Utah. Oh, damn. He's even closer. He's even closer to California. Well, I hope he doesn't visit. Um, so, you know, when you, it's not crypto is good. It's the, it's the principles of disintermediation that are good. It's the idea that if you have a bunch of middlemen, if you have point A and between point A and point B, there's a bunch of middlemen. Just think of like the housing. Cause I'm think of the housing market, all the little people, the rent takers, the, the people that take fees that eat money, that do all this stuff in between you and a seller. All these people, all these industries built between you wanting a thing and someone else selling a thing. How many middlemen do you think we have at node market between you and those tokens? None. Fucking zero. 
And this, and it's not, listen, disintermediation, the principle of disintermediation is incredibly valuable. Do you need to disintermediate everything? No. Some things you need a middleman. You know, like you need public services and goods and things like that. You need some kind of welfare system and all that. But as a general rule, most systems have a bunch of greedy asshole humans gummed up in the middle, taking, collecting rent, collecting fees, taking little toll fees. And if you can get rid of them and insert a little piece of software, which uh, I'll give uh, Nova Gratz his credit. He was, he, I heard him say this, he says, get rid of this, the, the middlemen and put in middleware. Middleware sounds stupid, but yes, disintermediate clogged frictiony gummy systems by getting the crap out of the middle, getting the rent takers out of the middle and just putting in bits of elegant software. And then the software becomes more elegant if it runs across AI rails and it becomes more elegant if it run, if it self manages across AGI rails, artificial general intelligent rails or swarms of agent systems and networks that work together, uh, uh, self kind of self evolving and executing code and writing code and nature and nurture and self self evolution all at the same time. Like that, that version of a system looks better. And there's so many little pockets of these frictions. So the principle, it isn't that you want to tell people crypto rules. It's that you want to tell people that many, not all, but many, probably most systems on earth are gummed up with middlemen and friction and bullshit. And if you could just disintermediate, Right. And that's why it's not like, oh, blockchain is the key. Well, listen, there's a lot of blockchains become this big word, this big term that means a lot of things. Um, there are a lot of directed acyclic graph projects and stuff like that that are not just they're not blockchain. I mean, they don't really have blocks in the traditional sense. They have like a melange or, or, a, or a, like a, a lattice of, of transactions and they gossip to each other transactions in, in real time. And they have this lattice of trans. Well, that's not blockchain in the traditional sense, but it's it's disintermediated systems, and the level of disintermediation has to do with what they're trying to accomplish. And you know, again, we'll get into uh, tomorrow as far as portfolios and all that kind of specific stuff. But that's what you guys need to be thinking about when you're talking about crypto to people. It's not about come here and make this money. I know that that's what people. I get a bunch of calls now and a bunch of texts from all my friends who've been dormant for two years. Oh, now they're interested in crypto again. Fuck off. I tell them I can't, dude, we talk about this stuff all day long. If you don't, if you want me to distill down what I do every day, you, you don't get to win. You don't get to just show up when you see on CNBC that Bitcoin's going up and it's time to win. No, 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 no. You do the work or, or have fun being poor. That's it. Everybody here, you guys are all doing the work. You deserve to win. That's another thing. People tell you in the future here in the next year, you're going to be seeing a lot of people, oh, you're so lucky. Lucky? How are we lucky? We've been here through the, this, the misery and the pain of these red markets. How, who's, who's lucky? Lucky. Anyway, luck is not a strategy. Uh, okay, so where does the revenue come from on Node Market? NFT sales? Okay, Lisa, let's try to explain this in a way that makes sense for everyone. See, when you go to exchange, all these sales, let's go. Total volume. Okay, 506. All right, let's look at HyperCycle. All right, see all these, these little guys right here? Every order that gets completed when someone, when you click buy, click, I say buy, okay, and I have to hook up my wallet and I purchase one or I list and I sell. All these 506.9, those are, that's the total volume of sales. Each one of those sales derives a two and a half percent fee, right? Paid by the buyer. The buyer takes, a, you know, there's a little bit of a fee on there. That's revenue. Once we get to uh, let's see. Um, we, we're going to get to a point where the nodes have a full market where you'll be able to buy and sell full nodes that are in production. That will derive a fee. Um, when you are, well, any, any commerce at all, any commerce at node market that derives a fee 
those fees are the revenue. The revenue is what gets paid to people. Does that make sense? That should make sense. That's how, you know, that's how exchanges work, right? Lisa, you know, that's how the kind of, it does that. Anyway. All right. Oh yeah, man. I've been lucky for years. Everybody's like, you're, you're so lucky. I'm like, was I lucky in the gold market? Well, no. Yeah. Okay. It's lucky. Every, every, I guess I'm just real lucky. No, you know what makes you lucky? I'll tell you what makes you lucky. Understanding game theory. If you understand game theory and you're aware of your own cognitive biases and you don't get emotional, like the worst thing you can ever do is answer the question when someone's like, well, what do you, what's your opinion of me? Don't ask, don't ask me that. Don't ask that question. You're not ready for that. Very few people are ready for that. But once you study game theory enough, not don't read to you read it for a day and a half. You're like, I'm ready. SIPG. Let's go. Let's go make money, bitches. No, man. No, takes more than that. But once you've kind of put game theory in your mind for, you know, six or eight months, this is about what it takes to, to where it starts demonstrably changing, changing your decision making processes and your, the way you kind of cascade ideas in your mind and things like that. So once you get to that point, then you say, okay, now I got to be aware of the speed bumps, the speed bumps, the hurdles, the challenges, whatever you want to call it, whatever your you know choice of words, the things that get in the way of making those rational game theoretical decisions, those are cognitive bias. So these two things work together. And then you say, okay, well, what if I want to build systems that have game theory based incentives so that I can have a system like, like, well, what we did at node market that incentivizes good behavior and disincentivizes bad behavior. Okay, cool. That's mechanism design. So that's taking game theory and going the other way. Okay, I'm going to design a structure with rules in this particular game or this particular environment. I'm going to create an incentive structure that will entice sane and rational individuals towards a sane and rational, uh, rational outcome that is the greatest good for the greatest amount of people, and that achieves Nash equilibrium. Yay. So – we do these things anyway. We're just weak at it. Everybody employs game theory, whether they realize it or not. It's just sometimes it's important to reduce things to the ultra simple so that you can see them. That's all we're trying to do, man. Anyway, uh, unrelated. Well, maybe. Twin token is coming. And by the way, um, those of you that want the twin token on day one, well, other than – I mean, we the twin token will be available at Node Market because obviously people are going to get the tokens and they're going to probably list them. If you want guaranteed allocation, you have to have the Node Market NFT. Yep, that's how that works. Anyway, okay, um, let's switch gears. We got to go to class. We're going to talk about debt. Who wants to talk about debt? Are you guys excited about debt? Let's see. Uh, your mother-in-law says you're the most lucky person she's ever known. Never seen anything like it. <laughs> yeah, listen, keep being lucky. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, what is it? That, you know, the more I practice, the luckier I get. So I get it. Um, but yeah, you guys, if you are approached by people that are um, that are talking to you about, um, oh, sorry. If you get approached by people that are asking you about crypto and all this kind of stuff, don't don't talk crypto. Don't make don't give anyone advice that those days are over with. We're just about to get where this market gets real stupid. You're going to see the worst behavior on the planet. So I don't tell anybody to buy anything. I tell most people, I was like, yeah, it's too late. You missed it. What? Yeah, you missed it. You buy when the market's red so that you you are exiting when the market's green. Um, we could have two year long bull market or we could have like a six month long bull market, or we could have a three, a three and a half year. We don't, no one knows the future, no technical analyst or anything. All of that stuff is stupid. All these technical analysis guys, it's, it's like they've got quarterback amnesia. They're wrong all the time. And yet every day, Oh, this is what's going to happen. No, shut up. It's not, <laughs> it's, it's never what's going to happen. These guys are so, so bad. And, but you know what? Dummy's going to dummy people that get their marching orders and their investment advice off Twitter. I'm not calling it X cause that's fucking stupid. The only thing that's X is 
the the balance sheet got X'd out when Elon shit talked all their uh, advertisers, which left, and now he's blaming them for his failing company. But like, don't get your investment advice from a bunch of people that have never made any money on fucking Twitter. Like, wake up. Also, these other these dudes on YouTube. You see the dude recording a video with like his his AirPods in, and he's like walking on the beach or he's in front of a rented car. He's like, the best way I learned to make $10,000 a minute. Bullshit. You make zero a minute. You're a fucking hack. There's so many of these dudes and it's going to get way worse because now that the greener markets are coming, the cons, the scams, the douchiness is going to get way, way more elegant. They're going to spend a little bit more money, better production value on the bullshit. Um, and also, just before we switch over to the to the brainiac part of the show, um, there, there airdrops don't happen. Okay, they're very rare. So, like, be very, very, very careful when you see like, oh, the airdrop, the AGIX airdrop, the hypercycle airdrop, the blah blah blah. It's all bullshit. Even if I tell you there's an airdrop, just assume it's bullshit, right? That people are going to try to steal all of your stuff. They're going to try to steal all your stuff, man. And some people in here are going to get stolen from. I would go slow. I would put in the tactic of always closing your MetaMask. after you, If you're using it, shut it down. Like lock MetaMask every time you're done using it. Don't just leave it on your computer and be like, everything's fine. Everything's not fine, man. People want to steal all your shit. All the time. That's that's what it should have been like. We had the other one that was like a little bit more proper, but that's what it really should be. People want to steal all of your shit all of the time. British language. AI. Done. Uh, okay. Anyway, let's switch gears. We're going to talk about navigating the dangerous waters of debt. And again, I'm going to – I'm not going to go behind the wall for this one because I think debt is so important. Um and it's not crypto specific. This is just general life specific uh, or, or generic. This is general life generic. Um, but uh, no, no, don't assume that. You don't know that. You need to assume everybody's trying to bullshit you. Listen, everybody wants to steal your stuff. Everybody. Everybody. You need to be in that mindset. And if you're in that mindset, you're much less likely to get screwed over. But if you're in the mindset that there's a few good, there's some decent people out there. No, because if what if you get fooled into thinking I'm communicating with you? Hey, Lisa, this is Nick. Let's do some um, this thing right here. I just need your private keys. All your shit's gone. All right. You need to assume everybody's trying to steal from you. Everyone, all the time. Everyone. Yeah, exactly. Even in video games, especially in video games. Um, well, no, because you might have just, uh, Howard, you could have someone as a digital investor that just joined yesterday, right? It, it takes a while. Listen, I know my way around and I still get stolen from, I got SIM swapped. I got <laughs> escrow stolen. I've got, I mean, everything, man. People just want to steal all your shit. Just assume it. Just assume it. All right. Uh, let's talk about the perils of debt. I don't like debt. Debt's bad. Class is in session. Hello. You're late. You're bad at math, but I'm giving you an A plus in confidence. Just doing what I gotta do. Extra credit. Okay. Um, real quick, before we start this discussion of debt, is there anyone in here that is still in some level of debt? Actually, you know what? Don't answer that. Answer me this. Is there anyone that in the last, say, 12 months has completely gotten out of debt? I ask this question a lot because it's pretty important. It gets back to the discussion of like managing a personal balance sheet. But specifically on the side of debt, you know, there is the other side of compounded interest. And that's the compounded interest that works in favor of increasing your debt load. And and yeah, this is this is very true. Have a have a separate laptop that you use for crypto stuff. I do. I don't use this one. 
and I do broadcast these stuff. I don't use this. I have another computer beside it that's not linked. Um, and when I'm not using that, I actually shut off the Wi-Fi. I shut off the Wi-Fi. I shut off the um, – I, I, I kill my MetaMask account, and I shut off Wi-Fi. Anyway. All right. Ooh, out of debt 18 months ago. Well done. Um, for those of you that are still in some level of debt, do you have – um, ooh, debt free. Nice. Doesn't that feel good? Okay. For those of you that have some level of debt, have you tried, or at least do you have a strategy to get out of debt over say the next 12 months? You say, listen, I've got a 12 month plan. Does everybody here have a 12 or 18 month plan to get out of debt? And if you don't want to answer, you don't have to answer, but at least you need to be thinking about that. Like you have to have a plan. Um, and yeah, I mean, I'm not, I, I kind of don't count housing debt. I'll, I mean, my personal opinion is that yes, that is debt, but, um, a lot of people for whatever reason are fleeced by the American system into thinking that housing debt is not debt. Listen, your whole, your whole monetary life boils down to this income expenses, assets, liabilities, what's left is cash flow. Right. And in some portion of that you can invest. And hopefully the portion of your cash flow that you invest over time with the effects of compound interest expands your balance sheet to the point where your your income being generated from your investments outweighs your expenses and your liabilities by a wide margin. Enough to outweigh them and give you a consistent income that more than replaces the other income that you use when you trade moments of your life to some middleman rent collecting asshole that is you are the commodity uh anyway god but debt can be nasty and so sometimes you know we talk about emotion we talk about not letting emotion get in the way but the uh, there is like a an emotional terrain of debt right Whereas we want to get to the financial empowerment side, which is the other side, where you're like, feel free. When you get tr like true freedom, um, then you kind of, you look back on those many, many years of being stuck in the debt system. And you realize how nasty that was on your personal life, on your health, mm -hmm. on your uh, relationships, right? So... Uh, it's just tough to be happy when you're in a mountain of debt. Very, very difficult. Um, okay, so we're going to talk about the effects uh, that millions of people suffer. I say it's kind of a suffering, but although we bring it on ourselves. Um, but it's this whole world of debt. That's why I have the monsters, right? Like debt monsters. Uh, you can thank Dolly3 for that. And it isn't just about numbers and interest rates. It's about the emotional journey, the emotional pressures. Again, we try to get rid of all this emotional baggage, but it, it is what it is. And that's all of these things that can lead us into debt. So our goal today, we want to understand the emotional aspects. We want to recognize the traps of predatory lending, like be on high alert for that stuff. I mean, we shouldn't. I stepped out of a housing deal, as you guys all know, a few weeks ago because I consider 9% APR on a house fucking predatory. And I'm not doing it. I don't care how much money I have, how much money I make. I refuse to pay to light money on fire in it at that level. Anyway, so today we want to understand the emotional aspects of all this and like how it kind of wells up inside us. We want to understand, you know, the signs of predatory lending. We want to explore, you know, some practical steps that we can take to manage and eventually free ourselves from debt because debt sucks. So let's talk about the emotional dynamics of debt. And you, you kind of start by acknowledging that debt can choke you, it can be overwhelming, and it can come on pretty fast. So a little bit of debt, a little bit of debt, it doesn't seem like much. And then you're completely just pushed underwater by it, like you suffocated by it. So it's like carrying a backpack and every step you take, like someone puts another brick in it and another brick and another brick, and it leads you to a lot of stress, a lot of anxiety. You can't sleep. Um, even like credit card debt. You look, someone want to jump on their computer right now and look up what the 
uh, average American owes in credit card debt and what the rates that they charge are is not pretty. And it's pushed on us. I mean, people push on you to take on debt, to take on leverage. Oh, you got to get get your credit cards. Get, come on, take some, use 30%. Bullshit. What kind, of, what kind of sense does that make? Oh, you got to, you want to score good with the agencies. You got to at least use 30% of your debt. Well, uh, no, mm -mm, that's not, that is not a thing. Um, anyway, this kind of burden, this kind of weight, the chokingness of stress and anxiety that's brought on by debt, like credit card debt, it starts small, you know, you buy some little thing. It seemed essential at the time. And you could in your mind justify, well, I'll pay that off next week and all this kind of stuff. And soon your balances grow. I mean, think of that 19%, 20%, 28%. Why? Because they lifted the ceiling on what credit card providers can do. And it used to be anything over, so over 18 or 19% was considered predatory. I mean, average credit card. Look at that. Average credit card debt. $7,958,000. Okay, Baja, do this. Go look up, while I'm talking, go look up the average income in America. So your average credit card debt, $7,900, so let's call it $8,000 at anywhere. We'd have to look up what is the average prevailing rates. So same thing. So if our average, now we got to go see what's the average prevailing interest rate on credit card debt. I bet it's 20 or above. So you're at 20 on let's say 8,000, so you're $1,600 and it's, and remember, it's compounding monthly. Actually, no, no, it's not compounding monthly. It's compounding more than that, but ugh, just, let's just factor in monthly. So it's not really a clear 1,600. Uh, oh God, 60,000, right? Okay, so we're at 60,000. Let's just, let's just say that's right. So we're at 8,000 and six, uh, against 60,000. Yeah. Once you factor in, yes, once you factor in the um, the amount of uh, debt service, you get numbers that look real bad. Real bad. Um, and this is, we're just talking about credit card debt right now, just to kind of keep it all in sync. But anyway, um, the balance grows, the stress grows, the anxiety grows, the debt grows, the interest grows. It, it is a nasty, nasty, vicious cycle. And so you're looking at something that's anywhere between 10, I'd say 10 to 20% of your income goes into debt service. And also remember, if your income is 60K a year, you're not walking with that. You know, in the best case scenario, you're walking with like 45 of that, 50, maybe 50 of that. So you're paying 12 on 50 is 20%. Plus the debt service, man. Anyway, um, so you say, okay, how do we get into debt? Let's let's unwind it. It is to an extent about instant gratification. And instant gratification tends to be the opposite of the investment mindset, which is that of delayed gratification, that of pleasure delaying, um, that of having a more infinite outlook, a longer term outlook versus the right now, the quick, the got to catch up. I met someone who lost tons of money on stupid NFT bullshit, and she had said, well, I got to, I, what do I need to buy right now? I got to catch up. I haven't, I'm like, you can't catch up. It's time on a racetrack. You're 10 laps down. You're never, you'll never catch up, period. You will not catch up, but you can do good for yourself. I'm sorry that that's a reality that people have a hard time with. If you're 10 years late, you fucking missed it. You will not catch up, period, because they're not quitting. The dudes that bought 14 cent Bitcoin aren't quitting. You will never, ever catch up, but that's okay. You don't need to catch up. You're not competing with them. You're competing with yourself, your own balance sheet. So you can still have a longer term. It doesn't matter. We all at some point die and no one goes, oh, well, he had more Ferraris than he did. So better, better person, good, good better afterlife. Bullshit. Anyway, if we can get out of this instant gratification, th this is the thing. I want something now, even if I can't afford it. If you can't afford it, you do not get to buy it. And that is the opposite of what we're getting through social media and advertisers like constantly pounding you, showing you, oh, this lifestyle is just one credit card swipe away. What, why do you think during COVID, uh, the purchase 
of luxury goods. Remember, the whole world shut down. No one's going to work. Luxury goods shot up tremendously, like by like a 5X. Do you want to know what the biggest cohort of luxury good purchaser, like people purchasing luxury goods was? People with incomes under 50,000. Think about that for a second. People that should be the farthest thing away from stupid ass coach, Gucci, Louis, Christian, like, what are you signaling? You're showing everyone that you've, I'm, I'm cool. I'm cool too. What is going on? Yeah, but this is the thing. It wasn't the free money they used. That's what's so crazy because they kept spending into 2022. It's still the biggest cohort of purchasers of luxury goods are people that make 50000 or less. That is not who those things are for. Why? You know what the biggest difference was? They extended credit. They let you buy. I bought, I, did I show you that T-shirt I have? I got a – it was a gift, by the way. I didn't pay for it. I have a Gucci shirt. It's a T-shirt that they let you finance. Finance a fucking T-shirt? Really? You want to talk about getting in trouble? If you need to buy a Gucci t-shirt so bad that you have to finance it, you need to think about your life because you've made a lot of very, very poor choices or other people made poor choices for you. So you get this, you get this societal pressure and we live in this culture where success is measured by the perception of material possessions. You want to know how many people own the stuff that they're driving around in? You know, I've been shopping for a car right now. We're looking for a car. Not for me. We're looking for a car, another car for the shop. And we had two cars wreck. And so that's how we do it. We had two cars crash. They're going to get paid out. We'll put another one up and we will rent it out. We're looking for this. There's like a, an electric Rolls Royce. And even among rich people, they're not buying them cash. They're financing. Be very careful. You see someone with a Ferrari. You see someone with a Rolls Royce. You see people live beyond their means. It's just a human, like it's just a, of our current environment, it's a human construct. It's our culture where success, the perception of success is broadcast by the perception of these material possessions, right? And I'm not, I'm not going to undo everybody's like nature and nurture in an, in 30 minute discussion today, but we need to think about what are the pressures that push us towards making debt decisions towards onboarding debt? Like that's the main thing today. I want you to just think how, how have I been seduced in the past into a, taking on debt? Is it trying to keep up appearances for some of us have, right? I actually forcibly downgraded my my daily driver, my car, I, I got rid of the McLaren. I didn't get rid of it. We're renting it. But like I'm no longer driving a McLaren. I was driving – I drove stupid cars. And I realized like what am I doing? Like who, am I driving it because I love this car? I mean I love it on the highway for a few minutes, but in L.A. you don't ever get to go fast. So I was like what am I actually driving this car for? Why am I even doing this? So I downgraded my car, like cut my car payment in a third. By going to an electric Mercedes, which let's be honest, it looks like a piece of shit. It's like an it looks like an Advil tablet. It's like a it's like a matte gray Advil tablet. It's stupid looking. No, I promise you, in that car, I've never no one has given it a second glance. Like no one. It, no one. When I drove the other cars that I drove, everybody would stop and, and gawk. It's bull. It's all bullshit. It really is. Anyway, but we get pressured into absorbing debt, trying to keep up appearances. And one, it harms your. Yeah, no, no, no. Mercedes are nice. They're great cars. They're very safe. The internal, internally, they're beautiful. But the point is, if you drive by in a Ferrari or a McLaren, or you drive by in an electric Advil tablet, it's a different experience. The way you get treated at a restaurant is a different experience and yes it's a it's a material downgrade um everybody's from from where everybody's in a different position anyway so 
We know that we are pressured in society towards signaling that everything's doing good. We know that we are um, telling everyone through our possessions, or at least the assumption of our possessions, where we are in society. So I just want you to put in the back of your mind, or at least think about it. Am I making decisions in my, of, am I making debt-based decisions based on a need or a desire to signal? You know, it's, I think it's important to kind of think about something like that. Okay, so let's talk about the predatory lending side. So this gets into the nature of the kind of lending. Um, these are practices where lenders take advantage of borrowers, often who are young, financially inexperienced, or financially burdened. Yes, they prey on people that are burdened. Um, and what they do is they'll lure you in with the promise of easy money, and then they will hide the true cost in the fine print. Uh, variable rate. Listen, same thing with variable rate mortgages, variable rate credit cards. Oh, first six months, it's zero. You're like, hell yeah, zero. I get stuff for free. No, no, no. That's not what it means. That's not what it means. <laughs> it means they are loading up. If a credit card company who's in the business of sapping you dry with interest is willing to extend you 12 months, 16 months, three months, eight months of, of zero interest, what do they know for a fact? They know for a fact statistically that you will not exit that card and, and resolve that debt, that you will quickly exhaust that time period and you will find yourself inside that predatory debt crunch. If they give you 12 months, it's because they know statistically you're never going to leave. You get used to using the card. You put it in your Apple Pay and all this kind of stuff. You're, you're done. They got you. Anyway, um, so, but they, this stuff's all kind of hidden in plain sight. So, um, well, payday loans, you guys know about this kind of scammy shit. It seems like a quick fix. Hey, miss, I'll get a, I get my pay in two weeks. Let's get a pay, let's get a payday loan, right? One, they have incredibly high interest rates, which means they're stealing back. If the interest rate is like, say 15 to 20%, that means 15 to 20% of your hour works. You just, you just hours work, you lit on fire. So if you, if you work a 40 hour work week, you just gave back four to six hours for free. You lit them on fire. See you later. Bye for a payday loan. Now, if you have to start getting payday loans to make it to the next paycheck, you're now behind, right? You have to be very cautious about stuff like this. If you find yourself needing payday loan, well, one, you wouldn't be in this group. I listen, man. Anybody in here who who needs payday loans right now, please cancel your membership. If you're pay, if you're paid to be a digital investor, cancel your membership and pay off your fucking loans. Get out of debt. Common sense. Anyway, um, if these if any of these offers seem too good to be true, they are too good to be true. Remember, these are these are companies that are in the business of sucking you dry. And then, and then selling the debt to a, to a collection agency that will attempt to scare you into sucking you dry again. No immediate gratification is worth long-time financial distress. None. None. I don't care if it's a house, a car, none of it. If you can't pay for it, you can't pay for it. Simple. The shit is simple. So, Okay. How do we manage and overcome debt? So, okay, great. We get bombarded by society. We get bombarded. Oh, take, you know, buy this 17%. Okay, we get it. We get it. There's all sorts of ways you can find yourself being lured into the mirage that debt's a cool thing at this one moment in time. Oh, if I could, if I could have that thing. You know, think about it. Just think about it like this. That new car feel. When you get a new car, how good, how good is it? How much does it feel like a new car? For how long? Five months, maybe six months. You're like, yeah, you get in, you're feeling good. Well, month seven, you're like, oh, this is a cool car. All right, I like it. I like it. People still tell me it's cool. A year in, you're like, okay, it's it's a car. I like this car. It's a cool car. It's done, it's done well for me. It's done well by me. We're a year in. Okay, we're a year into a seven-year or a six-year financing because that's what you had to do because you had to get the, them payments down, which means you're not making much of a payment. You're basically just uh, paying interest. Ah, who cares? 
I got that. Do you think six years, five years, four years, three years in, you still like that car? No, because it's no longer new and cool. It's a thing that is giving you stress every time you cut that check, every time that money leaves your bank account. You're like, God damn, seven years of this? That car was cool on year one. It was, it was cool for six months, but damn, I'm getting my ass kicked here. I got to get out of this car. I'm going to get another one. Ooh, that's the cool one. I'm going to get that one. Well, you owe like six years. going to be negative. I don't care. This is the one that's going to make me happy. No, no, no. And by the way, if you're getting a car, at least do not buy. Only fucking morons buy cars. I do not buy a car. Lease it. Get right off the lease. Anyway, so how do you escape the clutches of debt? You found yourself in it. Crap. Well, first, budgeting. You got to know where your money goes. You got to know where all of it goes. So you need to get a piece of paper. You're going to write, make a big square. You're going to cut the square into quarters. And you're going to write income, expenses, assets, liabilities, and whatever number is left, cash flow. Right? You, it, it's not just cutting expenses. It's about making informed choices and knowing where you're at. Know what your actual income is, meaning after taxes. Knowing what your expenses actually are, all of them, even the ones that pop up. If something pops up once every four months, don't leave it off. Divide it by, divide it by four and put it in your monthly expenses. Okay? Um, assets. What do you own that creates currency units against inflation? If it doesn't beat inflation, guess what? It's not an asset. And if you think, if, if you have assets that are actually, like if you own a home, is it an asset? Not if you don't rent it out. If you live there, it's not an asset. Okay? It's an expense. You pay property tax. You service it. You still pay. If you pay, it's a liability. Right? It's not an asset unless it makes money better than inflation. Who knows what that number really is, but I would guess it's somewhere around 7% when you factor in debasement. I'm not talking about like, um, you know, de deflate or inflation in the sense of like always and everywhere, the monetary phenomenon. I'm talking about like through credit and cash creation, the way they slowly, quietly murder you. Right, like just printing money on the side, spending it at spending it pre-inflation, where we get tortured with it post-inflation. Anyway, post-printing. But to reduce all that, you you have to fully understand your personal balance sheet. In the chat, tell me who here's done a personal balance sheet in the last um in the last six months. Uh, and no, no, it isn't. Um, if you and we can strongly disagree, but if you're talking about cars, you're wrong. Uh, I assure you um, that is the best way to proceed, uh, and I could spend years and millions of dollars showing you. Probably wouldn't work. But anyway, yes, you you lease. A, you do not buy a car. You lease it um, for oh, so, so many reasons. It's, it's beyond discussion. Anyway, if you've done your personal balance sheet, tell me this. Did you all of a sudden feel better? about your financial future because at least you had some good understanding. See, this is the thing. You got to know where you're at, right? It's like going on vacation. You got to know where you're at to know where you're going. Okay, great. So once you've done your personal balance sheet, you say, okay, now I can look at cutting expenses, making informed choices. I can build an emergency fund, for, right? With whatever my cash flow is, right? Which is what's the net that's left. So you start building a lifeboat. And that's your financial safety net. Now, if your lifeboat is not earning interest, it could also be, if it's losing interest, that means you're trading hours of your life and you're losing the value in that. So you have to be careful because a lot of times people think, oh, cash in my bank, that's an asset. No, it's not. Cash that doesn't beat inflation is a liability because that time is lost from your life. You already spent the time. The money equals the time. So if the money's not growing, you lost the time. Does that make sense? Build an emergency fund. Build your safety net. And this will um, this is where you go instead of high interest borrowing. Okay. If you're already in debt, go get some advice. 
it's funny. I have client, uh, I used to do a lot more consulting and I have high net worth clients that have a fucking mountain of debt. You would not imagine it. And they're like, well, this is what I want to do. And this one I was like, well, how much debt are you holding? Oh, it's a six or 700,000. I'm like, what do you stop? Stop. Let's tackle your debt first before we get rich in crypto, bro. Anyway, um, there are a bunch of resources from, you know, financial counselors to online tools. I mean, the best thing to do is to get an accountant, just get and just go borrow a few hours of time from an accountant and have him just with clear eyes, look at what you're doing and you're not going to like what you hear. It's like marriage counseling. No, it's her. Don't you get it? I was the one who paid for this session. She's the problem. No. Not really. Um, seek advice. Be open to seeking advice, right? Um, start with an accountant, but there's there's financial counselors. A lot of times they're both, right? Um, find yourself a good uh, a CPA that you trust. Um, do not use family members. Don't start pilfering. Don't Don't go into a family, your own network with any kind of financial questions. You need someone that's outside the chain. Um, outside the the circle of friendship or whatever they call it. Um, understand the power. We should all understand the power of compound interest, but understand that that works against us when the interest is against our debt. Is that right? Because now, the, now they're the ones getting rich with the compound interest. Um, by making regular payments, you reduce your debt faster. You don't have to wait till once a month. You can make two payments a month and just... Dunk, 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 dunk. Extra money ain't extra. If you have, if you owe anything, extra money is not yours. It's theirs. Pay off the fucking debt, right? And it's not just about paying off what you owe, but also about understanding how interest works and then using it to your advantage. Does that make sense? So, you know, debt is not just a financial issue and it takes on a lot of emotional components. And it is a very tumultuous emotional ride. Um, the pressures of society and this allure of instant gratification lead us into debt. Um, but you can be proactive. You can be aware. You can navigate your way out. Um, and also, Bird, you don't have to – the accountant doesn't have to be next to you in Idaho. <laughs> you can use the internet, man. <laughs> Um, but I encourage all of you to start taking more control of your personal balance sheet, more control of this financial future. We're going into a bullish phase in the crypto space. We don't know how long it's going to last. And all we can do is give you guidance during all of this stuff. You're going to do what you're going to do. But a lot of times what I also see is that when these markets get better and people start having money on their balance, you know, their, their portfolios grow, they start taking on debt thinking, oh, I can just pay it off. No, no, and no. When your portfolio is growing, that is a separate thing unrelated to your personal situation at home and your debt. If Man, if nothing else, use this coming bull run, bull market, bull whatever, half of it's going to be bullshit. Use it to get out of debt. It's, you will feel so good. You, listen, I... I think we talked about this last week. You will feel better that next, the day and the days after getting out of debt than any other financial thing that you'll ever do in your life ever. Like ever. There is not one thing that you can do. I don't care if you make a million dollars, $10 million, $100 million. There was actually a moment. There was a moment, like a fleeting moment when it doesn't matter when it was, but it was in the last 24 months where on paper I was over a hundred on paper. This doesn't mean anything. It was mostly illiquid, but on paper I was over a hundred. It still was not as good, not even near as good as when I got out of debt. And I, I've been out of debt a long time, but I do remember it specifically. Matter of fact, the gold business got me out of debt. Um, and man, I was with my buddy, Hank, that's so what we were banging silver out. We were buying silver, like silverware, smashing it, going and selling the, um, selling the silver. 
And we did it. We got very efficient at it. And I'm always like, listen, if, if I lose everything, I'm going back to that again, I'll just go do it again because that's good money. It's good money in silver at that time. This was silver was like, eh, 28, 30 bucks an ounce. That's a lot cheaper now, but you can still do it. Anyway, point was when I got out of debt, I'm man. I don't know if we, I don't know if we went to McDonald's or something like that, but I had a, I had nuggets. I had chicken McNuggets with honey, of course, because I'm not a communist. And I had a uh, hot fudge sundae with peanuts back then when they gave you peanuts because now they don't because everybody's got uh, allergies and you can't get a fucking good uh, sundae anymore. At And then I also had a um, – you know those apple pies that they have at McDonald's but they're not actually apple? Did you know that those are <laughs> those are like cinnamon and sugar uh, flavored uh, potatoes? Do you guys know that? It's not, it's not actually apples. In their, in their apple pie. It's like, it doesn't matter. I don't care. Those potatoes are delicious. Anyway, that was the meal. I remember, I know which one I was at. I was in, I was in Texas. Yeah. It was on the corner. Shit. It was on the corner of Valley View and Josie in North Dallas. And I just remember sitting there with my buddy Hank. I think he was out of debt too. I think we were both out of debt. I think that was we had done a bunch of big silver loads and we were out of debt. And we were just out of debt. Oh man. There's no better feeling, bro. Bro Cephas's. Anyway, I would urge you. Um, this this is your task. Your task is over this bull market, get completely out of debt and hopefully set yourself up. To never, ever be burdened with it again. And just keep in your mind. I'm not, I know I'm not going to cure anybody's years of kind of indoctrination into this me, me, me. Now, look how much cool shit I have society. I get it. I get it. But just be aware of it. And when it's starting to hit you, just ask yourself for a second. Is this thing that I'm going to use, that I'm going to use, that I'm going to absorb debt on, is it going to make me happy? Before I finish paying for the debt or, or is it going to last past that? Am I willing to take the burden of debt for this goddamn trinket, whatever it is? I'm an, am I going to get so many society points that it's worth it? I doubt it. Um, but that's a decision that everybody has to make personally. That's why those are little, these are the, these, see these guys they are like debt monsters. That's what I said in Dolly three. I said, a person being attacked by debt monsters. And so these are debt monsters for anybody that's curious. Those are, those are monsters of debt. I don't even know what the, I don't know how it achieved that, but those are pretty creepy. And this guy's got what, like, what is that? A shovel? What is he? What is that even? I don't even know what's going on there, but I know he's like, God damn it. Damn it. And this, this guy's got many arms. Look how many arms he's got. He's got like three going. Just clawing away, just clawing your shit away through compound interest. Uh, anyway, uh, we'll, we'll see you tomorrow for uh, digital investor. We're gonna do portfolio analysis and all that kind of stuff. Um, so yeah, stay in school. Don't do drugs. Don't do anything. My poor insolvent drunk starting on meth grandmother wouldn't do, which is very little because you know she's poor, insolvent, strung out on meth. Uh, people were like, "Well, you told me not to." No, no, no. Grandma's a mess. So if I'm telling you don't do anything she wouldn't do, she'll do everything. It means you're allowed to do anything you want. You see that, right? You see the reverse negative? Come on, people. Wise up. Are you tired of all the uneducated noise you're getting from the droves of YOLO meme coin peddling douchebag gurus out there trying to use you as their exit liquidity? Would you rather learn a competent university-level set of skills that will guide you in managing and investing for the rest of your life? Join us three days a week at Digital Investor. Develop your knowledge of game theory, cognitive bias, macroeconomics, monetary theory, investment theory, psychology of the crowds, and more. For more info on Digital Investor and how it can help you, reach out at nickblacknext.com.
Thank you.